One of my favorite topics to discuss is container gardening. And today we have a show packed full of everything you need to know to get the most out of your containers at home. You won't want to miss it. So stay tuned as we garden smart with containers. These moments of beauty and relaxation are brought to you by Proven Winners Flowering Shrubs, where every plant is performance tested, leaving you free to just enjoy. Find our award-winning shrubs at your local garden center. Memphis Wood Fire Grills. With the convenience of our patented IntelliBurn technology and convection oven cooking. Sear a steak, roast vegetables, bake cookies, or smoke meat using the power of Memphis Wood Fire Grills. DRAM has been providing gardeners with professional equipment for over 80 years. DRAM products feature nine water patterns and are designed to nurture your plants with a shower of rain. DRAM for lawn and garden. Available at garden centers near you. You have to rely on your gear. The way it feels. The way it does exactly what you need it to do. The F-Pace. How Jaguar makes it SUV. Today we return to the latest garden designed by Pamela Crawford that is a fascinating study in color and texture. This garden was designed to be a display garden for the latest container designs by artist Michael Carr, and these works of art are the first thing one sees upon entering the garden. Containers have the ability to transform the entire way we see the garden and experience plants. One of the finishing touches that really makes this garden sing is the lush sod that frames it and creates a wonderful backdrop to the vibrant colors featured therein. Today I'm joined by Jason Nugent from Harmony Sod to discuss the importance of selecting the right grass for your garden. Jason, thanks so much for joining us. Today we're talking about sod and I couldn't be more excited about it. Yeah, glad to be here. I mean, uh, any chance we get to talk about sod, uh from Harmony, we uh, definitely love the, the opportunity. Well, I've been watching this garden develop over many, many months, and there's been so much work that's gone into it. One of the beautiful finishing touches that, that it cannot be underestimated is the impact that this side has made, the way that it's framed this amazing garden. Yep. And um, just seeing that transformation occur has been really, really exciting. You look at sod, it's the, it's the last thing we always put down, right? When you do right. a garden or you're doing your landscape and it really just makes that landscape pop a whole lot. You know, take away the, you know, whether you have mulch or different areas here, whenever you make your greenscape that much bigger, it just brings that landscape and just makes it look a whole lot better. Oftentimes, I think that we think of sod as this ubiquitous green carpet, kind of this neutral thing that's, okay, well, we have this green patch sure. over here. That's not true, though. There are so many amazing cultivars, and sod has come a long way in, like, the last 20 or 30 years. You know, there's, there's varieties that are still out there that are 50 years old, and there's varieties that are two years old right now. And right. One thing we try and do at Harmony, we try and you know, get the best varieties out there. What does that really mean? We have an R&D facilities at different growers that we deal with that are researching different grasses that are not only better for the environment, but just easier to grow for the consumer. Less time mowing, where you're spending less time out in your yard and more time with your family. So let's talk about the sod that was used for this garden. Yeah, so it's a Bermuda. You know, there's uh, hundreds of cultivars, probably more than that of, of Bermuda, but specifically it's a uh, Bimini Bermuda. And it was uh, developed by Bethel Farms down in Florida. And okay. we have this grass now in Georgia, South Carolina, Florida, of course, Iraq. We just sent some wow. out to Iraq and we're getting ready to send some in, in California. And what we'd like to do is just see where this grass can grow, you know, sure. test it in different areas. And it went through a rigorous uh, certification process to, to be a certified grass. And it went through the University of Florida, Oklahoma State, to be sure this grass was gonna be what it is. You know, it takes years of, of research with the grass, right. the wear tolerance, the cold tolerance, the shade, and different things. This is one grass that actually came from a golf course. These guys know how to maintain grass, take care of it. They're like, this, is, this grass is very special. So. At the end of the day, we took three uh, samples from these golf horses, grew them out, and, and tested them. And we came back in blind, picked out two of the varieties, grew those out, 
tested those and blindly came back and picked the one variety and took one sprig. Wow. And we grew all that where I'm telling you it's across the world is from one sprig. Absolutely. I yeah. think oftentimes we don't think about how important the breeding components are, you know, that kind of development work. And that's in many ways the heart and soul of what, of what Harmony does. Yeah, you know, it's just, you look at our growers across uh, North America, we like to say we have the best growers. We're the nation's number one selling turf grass, but we have the best varieties, you know. And one thing about Harmony, what we've done is we've done for the consumer is like, don't worry about the variety, just know that you have the best. We branded our sod based on functionality. We have Harmony Home, Harmony Play, and Harmony Shade. So you as a consumer in California, whether you're in New York, New York or Key West, Florida, you all have Harmony Home, but we have a regional specific variety that we know that's best for you as a consumer, so you don't have to worry about that. And your Harmony Home could be Bimini Bermuda, right? Uh, which could be also your Harmony Play. We've kind of taken that worry of the customer about wearing all these thousands of cultivars of grasses and just kind of simplified it for them uh, in three kind of categories. And it's worked well for us. Well, Jason, I'm super excited to see what you come out with next. Yeah. And you make sod, you make sod fascinating. I love it. Yeah, we do. We try to make it as easy as possible to, to for the consumer and just, uh, you know, three simple ways, Harmony Home, Play, and Shade. Wonderful. Yeah. Awesome, Jason. Thank you for being with Absolutely. us. Absolutely. returns to the show to walk us through every aspect of container gardening and share with us many of the tips and tricks she's learned over the decades of careful research on her 12 books. All right, let's dive into containers. Pamela, welcome to the show. It's so good to see you again. Thank you, Eric. It's great to see you as well. So today, of course, we're talking containers because we have you here. <laughs> um, and I love growing in containers. There's so many advantages, um, but it is different than growing in ground. And I want us to talk a little bit about that. What are some of the principal differences between container gardening and in-ground gardening? Number one, I would say container gardening is easier. Okay. which is really important to people. Everybody's looking for fast and easy now. And I can give as an example these tomatoes. I had one summer when I had these all over my patio, my neighbor's tomatoes were dying from too much water. They all had them in the ground and they just literally drowned. Mine had these huge yields. Like if you look at this patio tomato, it had a yield of something like 60 tomatoes. And the reason is, that it drains. We're able to use this perfect soil. It drains really well. We have tons of room. The, the roots of the tomato plant go all the way to the base and it's just a really happy tomato. Right, and it's able to do that because it has air throughout this entire column of soil. Whereas, and especially in these, in these tougher soils that we have in the Georgia area with clay about, in many cases, four to six inches down. So the root system can only get so deep. And that also leaves the plants vulnerable to certain stresses. So a really, really deep root system, you know, it can mine the water from this entire profile. And so assuming we give it enough water, the plant has got a really, really nice buffer and it should keep it healthy and strong. When I started growing in these, a lot of plant people said, it's not gonna work. The roots are gonna stay at the top. You'll have really wimpy tomatoes. Well, although this tomato plant's a little bit old, it is not wimpy. So what you end up with is a really big production per square foot. If I'm looking at, 60 tomatoes in two square feet. I'm very happy about that. Oh no, that's incredible. So what I've noticed in my container gardening is that you really do get an instant effect. I mean, the, the plants take off in a way that they typically don't in the soil. So you really do get a lot more, a lot quicker. Right, it's good for people who don't like to wait for things <laughs> like me particularly. And we plant very close together in a container. Sure. There's a reason for that. A container garden is usually in between a flower arrangement and a landscape plant. Right, it's something okay. that's meant to give beauty like a flower arrangement, but it doesn't last as long as a landscape plant does. And for that reason, I plant the plants right next to each other in the container. And I was really surprised when I first started, I was so educated on landscape spacing. I was surprised to find out how well they did when you planted them that close together. Interesting. Yeah. So you do get that instant effect, but like you said, you know, because their plant is so close together, they might not last as long from a seasonality standpoint exactly. as something planted in the ground. Right. Because the roots are going to reach the edge of the pot. It doesn't have more room to go. And at that point, it's going to not be a happy plant. 
Let's talk about the water requirements too, because if we put all those plants into a media that also drains better than the native soil, it's gonna require more water, right? It does. And I always, when I have a lot of containers, have them hooked up to a drip system. It's on a timer because I just don't want to spend a whole lot of time watering. I want to spend time enjoying them. But for people who are watering themselves, there's a couple of things that are really important. Number one, understand that they need a lot more water. Mm -hmm. Number two, don't automatically water them all the time. You can put your finger on the soil and see if it feels dry. If it right. feels moist, they're fine. Number three, when you water, water with a watering wand. But what you want to be sure of is that the entire top of the soil gets watered so that it's even. There are times when you look at the soil and you see it's hard as a rock and it has pulled back from the sides. There's right. actually a space all the way in between. Right. If you have a small enough pot, then what I recommend doing is getting some kind of baking pan or something from your kitchen, putting this much of water in it, and put the whole pot on top of that, and right. let it slowly absorb that water from the bottom. And I think it's easier to rehydrate a really dry pot that way. Absolutely. Well, and, and that's one thing with, with a lot of the, the container medias. If they get too dry, they become hydrophobic, where they actually start repelling water. Uh -huh. And that's what you're describing, where it, it pulls away from the edges. You can put the water on the top, and you almost see it beating up. And it may take a little bit to get it fully rehydrated. There are times when we're reaching the 90 degrees, 95 degrees in the summertime, and the sun's out all day long, where I'm watering some of my smaller pots twice a day. Oh, wow. The larger pots like this don't need water as often because they have such a large space to store it. Pamela, we spoke earlier about some of the things that we need to keep in mind to be successful with containers. I want us to get a little bit deeper into container planting basics. So let's talk about some of the common mistakes that people make and what we need to do instead of that. And um, let's just start with right plant. Exactly. You want to choose the right plant for the right place. It's very important that you know the light conditions. It's also very important that you have some idea how large the plant gets. And another thing that I think is important is to know how long the plants can bloom. I got Gerber daisies one time thinking they would bloom all summer. They bloom for a month and stop. And sometimes understanding where a plant is in its bloom cycle, you know, something like a foxglove, if you buy it when it's in full bloom, you know, you can't have high expectations that that plant two months later is going to produce any more flowers. That might be its one shot. You need to Google on your phone to find out information that's important that you don't know. Right. How long does this plant bloom? How tall does it get in the container? Does it need sun or shade? That may, would be the three real basics. So let's talk about actually, you know, planting the plant in the container. Um, you know, we see scenarios where, you know, the soil will be mounded up around the stem of the plant. Of course, that's not great. Right, people have a tendency, particularly when they're first starting, to put the little plant in the pot and they wanna put lots of soil around it and pile it up against that stem because they think that's taken good care of. It. The wet soil rots the stem and the stem falls off. Right. So you actually wanna put them out of that potting mix a little bit. I like to see mine about this far out and then I feel secure that I'm not gonna smother the little thing. Let's talk about fertilization. And, and this is a mistake that I've made many, many times where I see my plant looking a little chlorotic or you know the leaves are a little yellow. You know, you gotta be careful not to be too heavy handed. Number one, you're gonna do better with a slow release fertilizer right. because it lasts a lot longer than the liquids do. You need to find one that releases the nutrients based on time and not on water. I think it's also well worth investing in higher quality fertilizers. We don't have to necessarily get, get into all the details of why, but there are different qualities of nitrogen. The sources of nitrogen in a fertilizer actually make a big difference. So if the fertilizer is mostly ammoniacal nitrogen, it's actually very toxic to a plant. And so that big flush of growth that you see is the plant moving that nitrogen out of its system because it actually is slightly toxic to the plant. So if you overdo it, especially with the cheaper fertilizers that are designed for grass, it's very easy to burn a plant with the cheap fertilizers that are immediately available. Then with the, the long-term fertilizers, say like six month slow release fertilizers are a lot safer.
Pamela, there's so much that we need to know to be successful with containers. I want us to circle back around to selecting the right plant and just making sure that we understand what is what are the things that we need to keep in mind to make sure that we have the highest probability of bringing home something that's going to be successful. One thing I think is really important are regional differences. And when I first started writing this series of books on container gardening, I traveled a good bit. I wanted to see what people were doing all over the country. Surprisingly enough, I saw the same plants being used in New York, in Chicago, hmm. even in Vancouver that we were using in South Florida. But you plant them at different times. Okay. For, for example, most petunias do well all summer long in places like Victoria, Canada, or places like New York. If you do them all summer long in Georgia, they're going to burn up starting about June. They're really right. a spring plant or a fall plant. What else do we need to keep in mind when selecting the right plant for our container? Are you familiar with the plant? Right. Because if you're not familiar with it, what I recommend is that you just buy one instead of buying a bunch of them so that you'll be disappointed. It's nice when you have container gardens to have some areas for display containers, and those are for plants that, that you know, your tried and true plants, where you can just blast out and make it gorgeous. And then have just some small plants that maybe aren't in the exact focal point, and that's where you have your trial gardens. It's a great tip. Just wait and see you know, which ones can actually you know, be matriculated up to the big leagues. And then maybe next year on the basis of what you learned from those smaller containers, it could instruct what we do on a larger scale. I tested petunias one year. I had a lot of different varieties. I had branded petunias. That means a petunia that has a name like Supertunia. All of the branded petunias that I planted did just beautifully. In the case of the super petunias, that's a plant that has been bred for a specific additional tolerance that makes it particularly good for containers. A lot of the modern breeding programs are putting tremendous effort into plants that work well in containers, hanging baskets, so on and so forth, and that's kind of the way that they've been designed. So that's a natural choice. Pamela, one point that I really would like for our viewers to, to have driven home is, is how simple containers can be. And with as many beautiful, complicated you know, patterns and, and plant selections as you've done in containers, there are also as many containers that you've done where it's just one beautiful hero plant in a basic container. A wonderful example of that here are these enormous alocasias that are in these really beautiful blue pots. And the simplicity of just a wonderful dynamic statement plant in a beautiful container sometimes is all we need to do. And sometimes the containers are so beautiful that that's what you want to emphasize. If you take a look at this one, it's actually a translucent blue, meaning that there were layers of clear glaze that are put over each other. I chose those containers because they look great with the pool tile and then planted them very simply with some silver bromeliads. I think in this particular case, had I put elaborate plantings, it would have detracted from the overall look. Yeah, absolutely. And there are also, I've, I've seen a planting that you did that's a, a similar blue container just with a beautiful lime dracaena. It, it has a lot of the same effect as the alocasias that, that we see here in you know a big bold pot, but it can just be as simple as the contrast of like chartreuse foliage against this beautiful darker color. And it works. Right. Another wonderful container combination that I love to see, and I know you do a lot with, is succulents in containers. They can be a bold statement plant as well. Right, and this particular bowl, it's big enough that it really shows up. And I just used three flapjacks or Calancho thursifolia in it. And then what I'm looking at is dirt on top. Mm -hmm. I don't like to see dirt on top. So <laughs> I got some glass to use as a mulch. This is aqua glass. What I look for is glass that's been tumbled because I don't want the edges to be sharp. I don't want to cut myself. Another plant that, that you use in a lot of your container designs, or I should say category of plants, that oftentimes we don't think about using um, are vegetables and specifically squash, you know, where you have these enormous leaves as almost a, a lush tropical kind of kind of look to it. And we're not accustomed to seeing those in containers. In fact, when you do see an enormous like, you know, yellow crookneck squash or a zucchini that's bursting out of a container, it's really fascinating. Right. And that was just all learning from experiments. I had 1300 
vegetables to plant one summer, and I had a <laughs> lot of pots, so I just kept trying things. And what I found out was that simple vegetables in gorgeous pots make gorgeous container gardens. This squash is just amazing, and it likes being in a container that big. I love giant containers. If you have the space for them, they really are more forgiving. There's a lot more that you can do. The small containers are, are also cool for certain spots and you know, off the patio, et cetera. But for the squash, the reason why it's that big and robust is because it does have a nice big container to be happy in. Yes. Well, Pamela, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us. We had a wonderful day. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Each week we travel the country north to south, east to west, visiting some of the most exciting gardens, as well as talking to industry horticulturalists about design principles, new plants, and also how you can be most successful with your home gardens. We also love answering your gardening questions, so visit us on the web at Gardensmart.com. These moments of beauty and relaxation are brought to you by Proven Winners Flowering Shrubs, where every plant is performance tested, leaving you free to just enjoy. Find our award-winning shrubs at your local garden center. Memphis Wood Fire Grills. With the convenience of our patented IntelliBurn technology and convection oven cooking. Sear a steak, roast vegetables, bake cookies, or smoke meat using the power of Memphis Wood Fire Grills. DRAM has been providing gardeners with professional equipment for over 80 years. DRAM products feature nine water patterns and are designed to nurture your plants with a shower of rain. DRAM for lawn and garden, available at garden centers near you. You have to rely on your gear, the way it feels, the way it does exactly what you need it to do. The F-Pace, how Jaguar makes it SUV. Containers unlock so many new options for the gardener and have a way of elevating a design and creating exciting focal points for visitors. If you have questions about anything you've seen today, you can visit us on the web at Gardensmart.com. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram. And remember, even if you're a master gardener, there's always more to learn. So join us next week for more exciting garden tips and ideas as we Garden Smart. Thank you.